All right, welcome to our first session of the day on Big Talk from Small Libraries, um, the conference where all of our presenters for, from libraries with a population served or FTE of uh, 10,000 or less. That's our cutoff. Um, and our first library of the day is one of our smallest ones today. Um, your FTE uh, looks like it's 650. Is that still correct? It yeah. is. Yeah, awesome. So, um, Kelly Ansley is director of the library at um, the Lagrange, Lagrange College. Did I say that correctly? Yes, I know. I've had you on before. And she was on, um, she was in 2017, I think. Uh, she presented previously on Big Talk, so she is back again, awesome, um, to talk about redesigning spaces with students in mind. So I am going to hand it over to you, Kelly, to go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so I started here in LaGrange, um, and I love it, in about 2019, and we're going to talk, you know, about how redesigning spaces with students in mind is so important. Um, but also how you get your staff on board with that, too. Um, you know, that's a it's a big thing, depending on how many staff you have. Um, and it has been challenging, but it has been really rewarding, too. So picture it, the Lewis Library in 2019. Um, it is a very beautiful building. Um, this building was built in 2009 uh, prior to the library getting its own building. It was in an older building on campus. Um, it was in Banks Hall, and that building was built around um, the turn of the century, 1900. So it is. A, it was a very older building. Um, so right now we have about 45,000 square feet. It is three floors. Uh, we do have a separate 24-hour space that is accessible to um, students, faculty, and staff 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and it's funny, the 24 hour is probably the most popular space in the library, even though it's the smallest. Um, the students like to pack themselves in there like sardines. It's funny <laughs> to me. So in terms of staff, um, there, if, if I was fully staffed, um, this is what that would look like. Uh, right now, um, there is uh, me, obviously, um, the CERC specialist, I have the archive specialist, the ac acquisitions and journal assistant, the circulation assistant, um, cataloging and ILL. So I'm down three full-time librarians and a part-time position. And um, one of my um, circulation workers is actually out on FMLA. So it's kind of fun times here. Um, and part of this came about because of the efficiency review. So in um, 2021, um, the college underwent a massive efficiency review. Uh, it seems to kind of be the trend right now in most um, academic libraries especially, or well, it wasn't just library, but for the college, most colleges and universities are doing efficiency reviews um, to streamline a lot of processes, um, also figure out you know, what's working effectively and what's not. Um, and so due in part of that, we had to make a lot of spatial changes um, and we're really focusing on academic innovation. So this is a picture of our main floor um, when I started in 2019. So the reference collection was about 12,000 volumes. Um, on this floor, you also have the reference desk, the circulation desk, and this small reading area that you can see. Um, so the reference collection was pretty massive for the time. Um, upstairs on the third floor, we had all of these periodical shelving. And when I started, they were actually empty. So this was an older picture. Um, so they were in kind of a U-shaped formation with seats in between, uh, but there was nothing on the shelves. Uh, on the third floor, we also have the education, art, photography, music, and children's book collections, a pretty massive CD collection. Um, most of our DVDs, an auditorium, a classroom, and um, a lot of study space. On the first floor is where we have the majority of our books. So we have about 60,000 books in print downstairs on the first floor. Um, and I love these shelves because they're revolving shelves. Um, so it's really fun to get all the way in the back and then have to you know, move the shelves around to get what you need. We also oh, nice. have a, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Um, we also have a super archives and special collection, and there are some study spaces downstairs on the first floor. So that's kind of to orient you to how it looked when I started. So when I started, 
Um, it was still had more of an older library feel to it. Um, the students weren't really allowed to make a lot of noise or really talk. They couldn't eat or drink in here. Um, the study rooms had to be reserved and unlocked for use. Uh, and the laptops that we had could only be checked out for 24 hours. And as soon as that 24 hour deadline hit, you got charged $500. So um, it was probably a massive culture shock when I started and the first thing, you know, some of the first things that I did were immediately looking at things that we could change. Um, when I came to interview and I had a separate, um, I had a small, I had like 30 minutes, I guess, with the current library director um, and she was retiring. She had been with the college for about 45 years. Um, and she told me something that really has stuck with me. She said that she knew it was time for her to retire when she couldn't look at the library with fresh eyes. Everything that she saw was the way that it had been for so long and she couldn't see any different. Um, and I really thought that that was insightful and also you know, really impactful. Um, so when I started, I was like, okay, we need to make some pretty massive changes. Um, so we removed the periodical shelving upstairs on the third floor um, and I moved a bunch of tables that the library already had up there. I wanted to have a nice big open computer lab. The library had about 30 PCs at the time and they were spread out among the three floors and so really if you wanted to use a PC you kind of either had to know where it was um, or you kind of had to hunt for it. And I really wanted a central location where the students could be um, so that, you know, if they had questions about Excel or Microsoft Word or, you know, the college's LMS or something along those lines, um, you know, they would be in kind of one space where a help desk was um, so that they could get help without having to move around three floors of the library. We also moved the movie DVDs to the main floor. Um, so they had been interfiled with our educational DVDs. Um, and it was really hard for anybody to find, you know, just like the Marvel movies or maybe Harry Potter or something along those lines. Uh, we moved the study carols that were upstairs on the third floor down to the first floor. And our first floor became our quiet floor. Um, so to say that the staff were thrilled or less than thrilled is really an understatement. Um, the, these were pretty massive changes and I kind of started them right off the bat. Um, and they all took place over the course of that summer of 2019 because we don't offer a lot of in-person uh, summer classes here. So it was really easy to, you know, kind of have the time and everybody here to make those changes happen. And I'm also not the kind of director who's going to sit back and watch other people work. Um, I pitched in and I was moving around these tables and helping out too. Um, in a lot of ways, I think that helped because you're not just watching someone, you know, direct you, they're actually participating and making sure this stuff happens. We also had a lot of policy changes. Um, so I tell all the students to keep it to a dull roar and we're good. Um, our building is LEED Silver Certified, so we are a green space. It is architecturally beautiful, but the main floor and the third floor on either ends have these um, really pretty open cutout spaces. So if you're on the third floor, you can look over onto the second floor. Um, but what that means is, is that sound carries, and I am not a quiet person. Um, so students can usually hear me laugh upstairs on the third floor when I'm at the circulation desk. Um, they can eat and drink in here as long as they clean up after themselves. And we changed the laptop circulation policy so that laptops can circulate for 24 hours, two weeks, or an entire semester, depending on the needs of the student. Uh, about 75% of our students here um, are here on some form of financial aid. Uh, we are a private college, but um, a lot of our students are here on financial aid. Uh, I also changed it so that there were no late fees on anything that was not technology. Um, and primarily, even the students who bring a laptop back late, we go ahead and waive them as long as we get them back. Um, that's just kind of something that we use as a way to be like, okay, if you don't bring them back, you're going to be charged, but it's usually like $5. All right, so I got lots of comments from my staff. Um, you know, the students aren't going to use the computers when we put them all together. 
Um, no late fees, eating and drinking. They're going to a party in the library. Um, we don't have space to short store shelves. And I had somebody go to the vice president of financial operations and tell them that I was spending tens of thousands of dollars on new furniture. When in reality, um, all the furniture that we were moving around was existing. It's stuff that we already had and I did not spend any money on anything. So how do you get your staff on board? Well, you know, you have to identify the change and why. Um, and I went about this with staff meetings. So we had lots of staff meetings over the summer where I talked about how I had to get familiar with um, the library, the books that were being used, how circulation worked, the classes on this campus, um, and really get an idea of how the space was being used. Um, and so one of the ways that I did that is I instituted an hourly count policy. Um, so I created a Google form, well, a Google sheet, and um, somebody, it's usually a student worker, um, goes around the library once an hour, usually at the top of the hour, and every single room, every single space gets recorded for usage statistics. Um, so this gave me a lot of really good insight into what the students were using the most um, and how we can reconfigure those spaces. And, you know, kind of explaining to the staff, like, what is the benefit to me? Um, well, as most of you probably know, if uh, a library wants to be funded, it has to be used. Um, so statistically, the library was very underused for the size before I started, and even into that first uh, fall semester of 2019. So stats are life. And um, in order for us to remain um, an active place on campus, there needed to be some changes. Um, and then also taking into account their reservations or, and or hesitations. I've always told my staff that if you have a question about something, please ask. If you um, don't agree with something I'm doing, you can tell me. Like, we can have a conversation about this. You don't have to agree with everything that I'm doing. Um, but I want to know what your reservations are, and then hopefully we can address them and work through it. Um, but at some point, I had to be like, well, just saying that because this is the way it's always been done is how it's going to be done is not going to go well with me. Um, change is hard, but it is necessary. And then, of course, COVID hit. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, and from the spring of 2020, um, really, we came back in that summer, so the fall of 2020 um, and on, that computer lab really wasn't used much at all. There is a big push for students to have their own laptops. Um, because of CARES money, we were actually able to buy 80 brand new laptops for the library, 45 of which circulate, and then the other 35 we use for in-house things. We have a lot of testing that goes on here. Uh, like for the college and of course library instruction any presentations or things like that um, we had to make all the spaces COVID accessible and so this was a really big change for everybody in the library um, well I mean everybody on campus really and then my staff were very resistant to working the circulation desk and having to interact with the students um, and that was really hard because you know that is a uh, that's your customer service point. Um, and if I had, I had staff constantly telling me that they were not going to be at the reference desk if a student was there, um, you know, they would sit elsewhere or, um, you know, they just flat out refused. And so that took a lot of um, negotiating in terms of how we could make that work for everybody. I've also spoken with other library directors to get their take on things. Um, and one of them is Aaron Weimer. He's the library director in a South Carolina university. Um, and he also spoke of COVID related change resistance with me. Um, so to date, it's 2023. And while COVID is still out there, um, it has, knock on wood, you know, kind of not as bad as it was. Um, he still has plexiglass up at his circulation desk and other customer service points um, because his staff um, are very, very resistant to it coming down. Um, and so he originally gave them a deadline and said, okay, we're taking it down this past December, um, but his staff were still very reticent about it. And so he extended that deadline until around spring break. Um, and 
at this point he's kind of just said well it needs to come down it's not effective because i don't know about y'all but even here at my library and at his nobody ever stopped in front of that piece of plexiglass they always moved to the side where it wasn't to speak to you uh, so then it's really ineffectual he also spoke of resistance to weeding the print collection um, at his library as well and we'll talk about that in a little bit So during this efficiency review, um, which I was heavily involved in, you know, we identified areas, um, programmatic areas that needed to be redone, um, or we just needed to get rid of altogether. We're a very small institution. In our heyday, at most, we had 1,100 students. Um, so having 70 some odd majors and programs is very big and just uh, maybe a little bit too much. So that was one area the efficiency review touched on. Um, but another one was utilizing spaces on campus that were underutilized. Um, so in the fall of 2021, um, I mean really in 2019 when I started, I really harped on the fact that our technical services area of the library was not being used at all. I mean, when we were ordering tens of thousands of books a year, yeah, it totally was. Um, that's where everything happened. But when I started, it was primarily used for storage um, or birthday parties for the staff or any kind of staff get togethers or meetings. Uh, so it was very underutilized. And it kind of um, is, it's close enough to our 24 hour space where it really could have been an extension of the 24 hour and the students would then have more space to cram themselves in. So maybe a little less like sardines. Um, and it wasn't until fall of 2021 after we were kind of wrapping up the efficiency review um, that the administration really started listening to me about what the potential for this space was. And it went through several iterations before it landed on the tutoring lab. Um, at one point, maybe it could have been a maker space and it would have been a fantastic space for that. But um, we would have had to have a donor that was willing to give us the money to buy all the awesome things for a maker space. And then really redesigning the area. Um, eventually it was landed on that it would become the new tutoring lab. So tutoring and writing already occurred in the library but in very small study room-like spaces. Um, so we had a donor who was willing to um, give us, you know, donate the money for new furniture, paint, and flooring. It also happened to be the same family who originally donated to create the 24-hour space. And so they very generously, when we renovated the tutoring lab, went ahead and updated our 24-hour space too, and it is beautiful. So this picture is what it looks like right now. Um, but if you can kind of use your imagination, um, there those cubby areas that you see kind of on the right, um, mm -hmm. those were cubicle workspaces. And um, there was a mailbox in there um, and carpet, and you know the paint was original to the library and things like that. So it is really a beautiful updated space for the, tu for the students. But when that happened, we had to get everything out of that space. And originally, I was told um, in late November of 2021 that all of the flooring and paint would be done in January of 2022. Uh, so we had a short amount of time to kind of clear out that space. So um, I used that as an opportunity to take the vision that I had for the main floor of the library um, and really kind of start working on what I wanted that to look like. Uh, the main floor of the library is beautiful. You have these really gorgeous windows on either end. It's lots of light. Um, but about halfway through, you had the reference collection, um, which was about 12 shelves and, like I said, about 12,000 books. Uh, when we pulled numbers on those books, only about 80% of them um, were... 20%, I'm sorry, were published after 1995. So we have this very old and out of date reference collection. I pulled a book off the shelf randomly that was published in the 60s on secretary etiquette. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Uh, wow, relevant. 
Yeah, but not something that needs to be in the reference collection, for sure. Um, and, you know, the way most uh, academic libraries are going right now is interfiling reference books into the stacks and not having a traditional reference collection that you can't check out. Um, so I took this opportunity to go ahead and start redesigning the main floor of the library. We don't have a student union here. We're just too small and we don't have enough space. So in a lot of ways, the library fulfills that need. Um, so as we were clearing everything out of the tutoring lab, I went ahead and told all of my staff that we were going to remove the reference collection as it was. And I got a lot of pushback. <laughs> um, so we started weeding. Um, the library was not weeded as it probably should have been since they moved into this building, which means that nothing was going. There was no yearly weeding that was being done, uh, which accounts for, you know, the number of books in the reference collection that were really out of date. Um, so I also got a lot of pushback from faculty on the reference collection. The faculty here, uh, the majority of them have been here for 20 plus years and they did not want to see the reference collection go, and so I compromised. It got moved downstairs to the first floor. It starts the rest of our collection, and we did weed it, but we left a lot of materials that were a little bit more relevant too. So it's interesting to me, after I started doing this, the Chronicle of Higher Education had a virtual forum on the future of academic libraries, and they also um, published a special publication on um, the changes that we are, the spatial changes that we are seeing in academic libraries. Um, and one of the quotes that I really liked was that endless book stacks have given way to more flexible spaces and a more flexible mission. Um, and I really think that's how the library here needs to go as well. Uh, more collaborative open spaces, yes, still have a print collection. Um, but really having those open spaces where students can, you know, kind of relax and study are uh, very beneficial as well. Um, so I turned the main floor into a collaborative workspace. Because the students were not using the um, computer lab as it was anymore, and we got all of those laptops that they could check out, um, I took the tables that were upstairs and brought them down to the main floor after we removed all the reference books. Um, and I really wanted the library to be a place where the students felt welcome um, because there's been lots of research that has been done that um, students have a fear of the space. It's not the people and it's not the books in the library. It is the building itself. It's this huge, like, scary thing. It's the, you know, it holds the all the knowledge kind of idea. Um, but I wanted the students to be able to come in here and just hang out if they wanted to. I mean, if they happen to fall asleep while studying, hopefully they're getting it through osmosis. But, you know, really <laughs> be comfortable in the space, because if they're comfortable in the space and with the people, they're more likely to ask us for help when they do need articles uh, for their papers or they need a book source or something along those lines. Again, I got all sorts of comments from my staff. Um, you know, I was told that it's going to look awful, that nobody was going to like it. Um, and one of my staff actually went to some of the faculty about the books that I was weeding. Um, and then I got to hear from the faculty as well. Um, and that was really difficult. Um, I wish they could have seen what was in my head. I am not a graphic designer. So I couldn't really draw the space out. Um, I tried to show them some pictures of what I really wanted it to look like. but it's the way that it had been forever, and it was a huge change, um, and so they were very, very hesitant. So on your left, you have the before picture, and on the right, you have the after. Um, the picture is taken from the reverse, so on the left, you're seeing it from the window side, and on the right, I took it from looking towards the windows. Um, but we were able to pull down nine tables, um, and we moved all of the reference shelves. Some of them did have to go into storage, um, but this is probably one of the most popular spaces now in the library. The 24, I don't think that's ever gonna change. They will always go and use the 24. Um, but this collaborative workspace, um, the students love it. 
they we have study halls that meet here we have cultural enrichment events on campus that the students have to have a certain number to graduate and so occasionally they will host these in this space as well and it works so well because it's it's a way to attract more students to these events so instead of having it in a traditional classroom or an auditorium you're in this nice open space and um, you still have students coming in the library and so they're like oh I wonder what's going on back there and then they can just join and there is no opening or closing of doors or really an interruption to the presenter um, um, this past summer it was fantastic because uh, we got a number of new HVAC systems and so our dining hall is one that had to have one so it was closed over the summer but we still had orientations for incoming students and they did it all in the library and I loved it so um, you know they used the tables they were eating in here so they had their meals in here it was a really great way for um, me to have an opportunity to go and talk to every student that was incoming before they even started. Um, it was really fantastic. So now we have this really beautiful open space. I love that picture on the right there. Um, it reminds me, it, when I first saw it, it just popped in my head. It reminds me of like the pictures you see, the overhead pictures of something like the Library of Congress or a major pub where it's just rows and rows of tables. And you think yes. of a library as rows and rows of shelves, but that's never what the Library of Congress has been. You, you look at it and you see tables and people doing things. Right. Well, and that's really what you want. I mean, the books certainly have value. Um, and it's interesting to me because before I came to LaGrange, I was um, at a school in the university um, system of Georgia, which is the public colleges and university system. And Georgia Tech actually a couple years ago went to a bookless model for their main library. And so the library is just floors and floors and floors of open spaces with different um, table setups and you know maker spaces and things that you would need um, and they were able to completely take their collection and move it to an off-site repository and it works great for them um, but I think you'd be hard-pressed at this in this day and age to find a library that doesn't have some sort of learning commons or collaborative learning space for students oh, because yeah. they're desperately needed Okay, so after we did this and it was all done, these are the comments I got from my staff. Um, it looks great, the students love it, administration loves it. Um, it was kind of funny to me because, you know, I had to get approval to do all of these changes. And I was specifically told that it better look good or we'd have to put it all back. <laughs> and I was like, oh, do you realize how much work this is? So thankfully it does look good. Um, the president of the campus uses the library as a, um, I don't want to say a showpiece, but that's kind of what it is. Anytime somebody comes on campus who might be a potential donor, uh, we had the, a legislator here not too long ago. She always brings them to the library and shows them around the library. Um, it really is one of the most popular spaces on campus. And it's one of the fewer spaces where um, I am actively trying to do academic innovation, which is our part of our current QEP. And if you're not in an academic library, that is our quality enhancement plan. Um, and that is directly tied to our accreditation. Okay, so what's coming up next? Because I'm not done. <laughs> uh, so, when um, the library was moved to this brand new building, they significantly weeded the collection, but that was back in 2009. And like I said, they haven't really um, done much weeding uh, before I started in 2019, and so that would have already been 10 years later. So two years ago, I pulled a report, um, and I wanted to see what books hadn't been checked out in the last 10 years. Uh, it was approximately 40,000 books. So, well, not just books, that's anything in the library, so any materials in the library. Um, and I waited two years before I did that because I needed to have a better idea of what was being checked out, which programs were using print resources more than digital, which ones were using digital more than print. Um, so that was very strategic on my part. But when I pulled this report and I told everybody that we were going to start weeding it, um, I had 
one person who absolutely refused to help. Um, and they said that, you know, they, we had spent so much money on these books and we didn't really need to get rid of them. And it was such a waste. Um, and, you know, I hadn't been here long enough that like these, these classes were being taught on a cycle. Um, and so my point to him was what I just said. I intentionally waited two years before even doing that. Um, I needed to get everything else under control and I needed to see what was going on. Um, and it's taken a lot of time and effort to really get everybody on board, but we are not a repository. If it is something that we have um, in print that is not accessible um, in a copyrighted legal manner or digitally, then we're going to keep it, of course. Um, or if I know that it's a book that um, is used very heavily in-house, but it is not being checked out, then we're going to keep that too. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, give and take with this. Uh, the CD collection has been uh, a point of contention, though, because we have over 500 CDs. So we have a pretty big music program here. Um, but none of them have been checked out in the four years that I have been here. Um, we have access to Naxos Music Library, which is a really fantastic database. Um, and so the students don't have to come and check out those CDs anymore. And it's not like they're popular music CDs. Um, they tend to be more um, classical or scores. Um, there's a wide range of them, but they're not something that your average person is just going to come in and check out. And because of streaming, they're not doing that anyway. Well, I had a staff person that was adamant that we are not getting rid of them. And so I made them a deal. I said, if you go through every one of these um, CDs and what you cannot find in Naxos Music Library, we will keep those, but we will get rid of the rest. So that was about, I must say like three to four months ago, and he hasn't touched not one of those CDs. Um, so I'm going to give him a deadline and be like, you have to do this by this deadline or we will just go ahead and withdraw them. Um, we don't have, we really don't have the space to keep them and they are just collecting dust. Um, and similarly, Aaron Weimer had um, some pushback from his staff when he wanted to weed the collection. And so his take on this was to gradually weed it um, the reference collection and then begin interfiling it uh, with the rest of the books. And he was telling me that when they did this, um, they had about five ranges of free shelves um, and they were empty. And um, he laughed because um, his staff didn't um, consolidate the collection at that point. They just had these five ranges of shelves that were um, completely empty. So we need to start looking at um, supplementing the print with digital. Um, I really want to transform that third floor space into another open area collaborative space too. I want it to be a little bit different in design, maybe not have like the tables as they're set up now. I would love some modular tables and seating. Um, you know, maybe those, I don't know if y'all have ever seen them, but they, um, they kind of look like something out of an alien spaceship where it's like a semicircle um, booth style seating and the backs come up kind of high. So it offers you some privacy. Um, but right now upstairs, we have our education collection, all of our art collection, and then our music collection. And it is very extensive. Um, but when I go and do instruction or when um, I talk to the faculty in education, nursing, business, or science, they don't send their students over to look at our books in print. Um, they rely solely on our digital resources for their research. Hmm. Um, and, you know, part of that is because we can't keep up with a print collection for them anymore. Um, information is coming out way too fast for us to be able to do that. And um, when you're going into these particular fields, you're going to be using a lot of digital resources. Um, books, yes, but you're going to rely more on those digital resources. So we really need to look at those collections and see what we can weed. Um, and if we can weed enough of the stuff that is upstairs on the third floor, then I can move what's left of the collection downstairs to the first floor. And then we will have that 
other really nice, open, pretty space. But again, lots of staff pushback. Um, you know, libraries are supposed to have books in them and we can't completely get rid of the print collections. Um, and so I have challenged my staff, show me research, show me, you know, statistics that tell me that these are the books that we need to keep in this space. Um, and don't rely on you not wanting to part with this information. If I have a book in front of me and I can find it digitally, and it is a book where I know for a fact the students are not going to come check out this book, they are going to go to the digital resource, then we most likely will get rid of that one that's in print. So it's been uh, it's been very interesting, and um, you know some of the things I learned that staff buy-in is fantastic. You want everybody to be happy. You want everybody to be happy, um, and you want them to feel like they have a voice. But it's not always feasible um, to make them all happy at the same time. And at the end of the day, uh, we have to do what we need to do for the people that we are serving. Um, a lot of our students didn't grow up with print books, in fact, the majority of them. Or if they did, it was kind of nominal use. Um, and having a print collection that they can use is very, very helpful. Um, but we have to stay with the times that we are in. And most of our students, um, some of them I call one-click wonders because um, they want information at lightning speed. They want to immediately be able to click on something and get the answers that they need. And of course, we know that that's not always going to happen. Um, but that's one reason why I wanted to move the reference collection downstairs to the first floor. Ease of access. Uh, so these students did not want to go on three different floors to find what they needed. Um, and then this way, there's the reference collection on the first floor. If they find what they need in the reference collection, but they want to look at other books, then they can look at that same call number and then just go straight back. Um, to the circulating books in that same call number range. Um, this has actually increased our circulation by about 50%, um, which was fantastic. And primarily I know now that we circulate more books for history and religion than we do for any other program on campus. Um, our print collection is in some ways unique. We do have uh, books that have publication date ranges of all the way back to about 1880. Um, and so the history students rely very heavily on those resources. But like I said, those other programs tend to just look at things that are digital. Um, so I have tried to make changes gradually if it was possible. Um, when you rip the Band-Aid off of someone that is not paying attention, it is, um, it's kind of scary and it causes a lot of strain for that person. Um, so if you can build people up to all of these changes, then um, I have found that that causes a lot less people to kind of freak out and, um, you know, they can adjust to those changes. And, you know, at the end of the day, you can't please everyone all the time. Um, it would be great if we could, but it's just not possible. Um, one of the things that we that I have also done that was a huge change uh, that I didn't include on this was we have a super archives and special collections downstairs. It primarily houses the history of the college. Um, so we have meeting minutes um, all the way back to about 1880 and a lot of um, photographs and, you know, things like that. Um, really cool information that is down there, but it is a very small space. and um, when I started, my archive specialist desk was out in the middle of the archives, um, and it was very messy, and um, people didn't use it a lot because they felt like they were walking into someone's office. Um, so for three years, I had to warm her up to the idea of us making this huge change uh, so that she wasn't, her desk wasn't out in the archives, and um, it was not as messy. And it also had one of those, gosh, I don't even know, like 12 foot long tables. I mean, this table was massive um, in the space and it was really too big for the space. So this past winter, um, we moved her into an office where she still has access to the archives. So she's always available, but now she has her own office. 
Um, and we reconfigured that space so it was much more open and um, more of a collaborative style. I'm big on the collaboration. And um, every it's getting a lot more use now and people are really enjoying it. We also came up with a um, immersive experience. Uh, those seem to be pretty popular right now. So students or faculty or staff or community members, alumni, anybody really can come down to the archives and do this immersive experience. So there's a six minute video about the history of the college that she created. Um, she's done a lot of oral history interviews. So we have taken clips of those and put them on laptops. And then people can go from the video um, to the clips of the oral history interviews um, and then into the reading room, which has a lot of um, the history of the college on display. Uh, so making those kinds of changes has really helped as well. Um, but getting everybody on board, like I said, has been quite a challenge. Um, so if anybody has any questions or comments, I'm happy to take them. Uh, sure, yes. Uh, thank you so much, Kelly. That was a awesome transformation there at the library. <laughs> Um, and the struggle, yeah, um, it sounds like something we've heard from many, many libraries, <laughs> uh, the same things that you were still struggling with um, so recently, which is interesting because I know I've been hearing about these things forever, <laughs> these same issues, the same pushback, and it's, you know, people have to know it's, it hasn't changed. It's still out there, so, um, with some staff. And that's right. something well, and figuring out how to deal with it. I mean, I have talked to lots of friends who are directors. I mean, I talk to my staff constantly. I always want them to feel like they have an open door with me. Um, mm -hmm. And their their feelings are valid. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, just kind of reinforcing the fact that I hear you and I understand what you're saying, but we cannot be stagnant. Mm -hmm. We have to move mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right. So, yes, we do have some questions coming in. So for anyone who wants to, um, yes, you can use the questions section in your GoToWebinar interface. I am monitoring that here on my computer. So go ahead and type in anything you want to ask or comments, um, anything in there, and I will uh, share it with our speaker today, speakers, all of our speakers today. Um, so first up, we do have someone who said, um, when you were just getting started, they're so excited for this session as we are currently redoing our library space to make it more student friendly. And this person is in a small one room rural library with under 350 people. Wow. So, so <laughs> I've been there. More of a challenge, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is challenging. So the first library that I worked for, it was a library that was basically in a classroom. Mm-hmm. And like trying to figure out spatially how everything was going to work and, um, you know, what you can put where and then computers and then somebody has to work there. That is a huge challenge. Um, and I did a lot of research, honestly, to kind of figure out what would be the best fit for us. Um, I Googled a lot of academic library learning common spaces so that I could see images and kind of took it from there. Um, it's really hard, though. I got a feel for you. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's see some other uh, lots of questions coming in here. We got plenty of time in this uh, first hour to answer them, too. So we'll get through as much as we can. Um, so what first question came? What did you do with your weeded items? Um, well, so we our collection development policy. Let me say this. When I started, uh, we any books that we weeded from the collection or we got as donations that could not be used, um, we would send them off to Better World Books. Oh, great! Yep, which is a fantastic organization. Um, but you have to pay for you have to pay for shipping to do that. And then COVID hit, and we saw a decline in enrollment, and so we were not able to do that anymore. Um, so instead, um, we do a couple different things. Uh, we have a couple of local organizations that take them. Um, so one is a, um, it's called the Harmony House here in LaGrange. It is for women and children of um, domestic violence abuse. Um, mm -hmm. And so they have taken a lot of our resources so that they have, um, you know, as they transition 
from um, their those situations out of them. Um, they have books that they can read. I've also partnered with the local halfway house um, so that as inmates are released, um, they go to these halfway houses and they have a library that they can access uh, a good number of resources. And I have also partnered with the local jail. Um, nice. Yeah, and so those are ways that we can give back to the community um, because they're outdated for us and for our academic needs, uh, but that doesn't mean that they can't be used somewhere else. Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, how many librarians are on your staff? I'm not sure if you mentioned that previously. Right now, it's just me. <laughs> ah, solo librarian, absolutely. <laughs> right, so um, I have three full-time positions. I am currently searching for a digital resources librarian because um, they are going to let me fill one. And then hopefully, eventually, they'll let me be able to fill another. Um, but I have to say that even if I had three full-time librarians with the FTE that we have, it would probably be a little bit too much. It is not something I will ever tell administration, though. But um, I don't ever want to just be an administrator. I really enjoy being in the classroom and doing instruction for students. Um, so I would be happy if I had two other full-time librarians. Mm -hmm. Definitely would be helpful, yes. Um, just, okay, I'm just reading through these different questions we have here. Um, oh, here's an interesting question. And you mentioned you know, research and data and whatnot. Um, were you able to get any student input? Did you use student input before making changes? Um, we did. So every year, the SGA president comes to see me to tell me how much they love the library, but how much the students want more space, um, specifically in the 24. Um, and that's kind of how the idea to revitalize and reuse technical services kind of got off the ground um, because they were coming to me and they're like, we need more space. And I'm like, well, I don't really have much more space to give you for, the, for a 24 hour center. Um, but the library also sends out a survey to students, faculty, and staff every spring. Um, and one of the questions that we do ask is spatially, what would you like to see? Um, and I talk to a lot of the students that I know personally, um, and these students tend to be the ones who are involved in lots of clubs and organizations. Um, and I really solicited their feedback too about what they thought about us having this like big open collaborative space. And they all love the idea, thankfully. Um, and that helped a lot too. Mm -hmm. Definitely important, absolutely. Um, let's see. Just, uh, lots of comments come in about great. Thank you for the presentation. Love seeing a lot of the changes. Um, uh, and uh, here, uh, where is it like? Bless your patience. <laughs> Um, someone says, I've had to use the line, we're not a book mu museum, we're a circulation library. Oh, definitely. And that's where I keep telling everybody that we're not a repository. And honestly, it's really only one of my staff who is super hung up on us not getting rid of any of the books. Um, and it is challenging. Uh, but we're getting to the point now where I think that we're just, I'm going to start putting my foot down a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm because it has to happen. It's just, it's wasted space and those materials aren't being used. Um, someone did comment about the staff resistance. Um, did anything possibly come up about that maybe working in the library is not the best fit for you anymore? <laughs> maybe uh, find another. No. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I can't lose any more staff. Well, see, so yeah, there's something you gotta. There's a line that you want to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you gotta. You kind of have to toe the line, and um, a lot of how I uh, lead is a direct result of how um, I was led before I became a director. And this is not my first time being a director. Before this, I was the director of another small uh, academic library, um, and I have I've had experience in public libraries too. Um, so. It's not, I look very young, and that has been interesting in this too, because most of my staff are older than me. Um, and they have been here for, like I said, 20 plus years. Mm. Uh, and I think that has played a part in it too. Um, 
Oh, somebody has a question about weeding, which is, and they mentioned, um, they said, how did you figure out what to weed? I come from a public library background and I struggle adapting crew to academic needs. How do you balance print versus digital needs in your, in your, in your budget? So yeah, how did you do, I know you talked about when they had last checked out. So we, we do two things here. Um, so I did, I do weeding according to, um, how often something has circulated and how often it has been marked as used. And of course you take that with a grain of salt because no matter how many times we tell um, the students don't put something back on the shelf once you pulled it, put it on this cart, they're still going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is looking at um, a couple different things. Um, I actually have a book on my desk right now that um, I just bought and I'll show it to you. It's called Right Sizing the Academic Collection academic mm -hmm. library collection. This has been very helpful. Um, right now, I would compare our collection to a car loan that is upside down. <laughs> uh, so if you think about it in terms of that, and you spend some time really kind of getting to know what the professors are requiring for them to use, um, and use whatever resources you have available to you, it'll be helpful. And because, you know, this is so different from a public library collection, it can mm -hmm. be hard, you know, to adjust to, well, what do we keep and what do we don't? Can you get it via interlibrary loan? Um, and do you have any partnerships in um, your state or if you're part of a consortia or something like that, where if you got rid of something that wasn't being used, but then later on down the line, six months, a year, something like that, somebody needs it. Is it something that you can get through interlibrary loan? Um, so we do look at the books in WorldCat uh, to see where everyone is, if anybody has it, how many libraries have it, if, we, if it's something that we can get if it's needed again. Right. You're not a museum. Might be yeah. interactive and yeah, <laughs> there are other places that own some of these things that you can get. Absolutely. Um, someone said they hopped over to your website and you have a, a floor map graphic. Yes. Of it yes, they said it looks great. So that's something maybe to take a look at on our. Um, if you if you all noticed on our um, schedule page, we I do link to all the different presenters' um, websites of their libraries. So definitely take a recommendation to take a look at that and see how. You know, that's, you know, a visual representation of here's where all everything is. Mm -hmm. And it's really very useful. Um, I got a couple more questions I want to do here. Um, don't want to run too much into the next hour. Um, oh. Uh, hmm. Someone says that we struggle with campus departments wanting to use the library during hours that we are closed especially during summer when we have a skeleton crew and shorter hours. Any advice or policy recommendations for managing security, staffing, et cetera, for groups using the library when it's technically closed? We want groups to use the library. So maybe saying, yes, we'll be open, but no library staff. I know when I worked at a university library, there was times when that was the situation. We had our 24 hour during finals and you're not gonna get librarian help because we're not there, but we'll have like a security person just to, keep an eye on things. Um, so that's super interesting because prior to me, that would never have been allowed. Um, either there was a staff person here if you needed to use after hours or it was just not gonna happen. Um, and I can tell you that my big push right now for the main floor of the library is to make it open 24 hours, but not staffed. And it would be pretty easy for us to do. Um, we have side stairs that um, we would just need to figure out how to block off. And I keep envisioning something like one of those mall gates, um, kind oh, of idea. Yeah. Uh, but the rest of the floor would be inaccessible to the main floor and the third floor. Um, we actually have this come up kind of frequently because for example, right now the students are on winter break. So they have to yesterday off and they have today off. So the library is only open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. But um, yesterday evening, um, a professor had reserved a space for a departmental meeting. Um, and he called me and he was like, well, it's at seven o'clock. So does that mean I need to move it? And I said, no, um, please still come to the library. And I said, I will let security know that you're able to be in the building. They will let you in. Um, and I was happy for them to still use the space. 
Oh, excuse me. I will say that it would be different if it was a student group. Um, if it was a student club or organization, then they would have to have their faculty or staff sponsor here. Mm -hmm. um, I've occasionally had uh, our student life department use the library after hours. Um, they streamed the World Series, for example, in our auditorium because we have a ginormous pro projector screen. It's kind of like being in a movie theater. Mm -hmm. um, but there was someone um, employed by the college who was monitoring that. But it's fine with me because the more space, the more use the space gets, you know, the happier the students are going to be, the more likely they're going to come back. Of course. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to do one last question. I know we're not going to get everybody's. We don't have time for everyone's, um, but you can reach out to Kelly at her library um, if you do want to ask her anything we don't get to. On um, this one last wrap up question. Um, now that you've been through this process where most of it, I know you still have things to do. Um, have you thinking back on it, would you go about the transformation differently if you could? Um, so more staff yeah. buy-in or, you know, what in <laughs> retrospect, what do you, what do you? So, yes, um, I have been told that I am too nice. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> by, by, uh, not necessarily by my staff, um, but by other library directors and they would have taken a more, um, I guess, heavy handed approach with it and just been like, mm -hmm. this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. Um, I think that if I had to do it all over again, uh, that I would start with a lot more gradual change. Um, but instead of ripping off the bandaid. So right. when they weren't looking, <laughs> but yeah. at some point, sometimes that's what you have to do. Um, if you have people who have been in a certain space for so long and they are used to the way it's done and then you have this new person come in and they're like, but I see all these awesome things that we could be doing. It is very difficult. And um, for some people, I don't know that they will ever be comfortable with changes here. True. Um, so for those people, it's always going to be a rip the bandaid off kind of thing. And then you have other staff who are going to be like, okay. I can kind of see that maybe you know what you're doing and we're just going to have to trust you. Um, so for some things, yeah, I think I could have gone a little bit slower. Um, I will tell you that that 40,000 book material weeding project, we started nominally and then we had to stop because um, the two librarians I had moved on to other institutions. And it's just not something that's really easy for me to do by myself. Yeah. Um, but we are picking that back up this summer and my staff are going to have to get on board with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned the weeding. We do have a comment here that I did want to share just before we do wrap up. Someone did say that um, you talked about what you did with the books that you should realize that there are sometimes laws or restrictions about what libraries can do with discarded books. Mm -hmm. um, this person says, for example, in Iowa, public libraries cannot donate withdrawn books to private organizations. So that, you know, just something to look into, make sure you're doing what you're doing is something you're allowed to do. Right. We're, we're kind of in a unique position because we're a private college. Right. Um, so. And this person was talking about public library rule oh, district. Yeah. Like yes. the public library restrictions are a lot more heavy. And so are the public schools and universities, too. They are very restricted with what they can do with discarded books. Um, so I'm a little bit fortunate in that area that. Um, you know, as long as our crediting body doesn't say anything, doesn't have anything to say about how we're doing it or any organizations that we're a part of, then usually it's fine. Yeah. Awesome. All right. And one last thing. Um, now that you've um, shown that you've had increase in, in, in usage and circulation, have any of your staff come around to this and are more becoming being more open to change potentially? I guess you could say in a roundabout way. Um, it's a lot of <laughs> like oh look our because i can show them the numbers and they're like cool more people are checking out books and i could even say well you know that's probably directly related to the fact that we moved everything down to one floor and it's easier to find and they're like maybe uh, okay. <laughs> not totally convinced oh all right all right we're gonna wrap things up here thank you so much kelly this is great yes thank you've you. done an awesome job there um, and someone also commenting, the outcome for the betterment of community is gratifying to see. So this has been awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.